Hey there, welcome to the anxious truth where this week on episode 300 of the podcast, we're going to talk about micro exposures. Micro exposures are small ways to practice dropping your resistance when you face what you fear as part of anxiety treatment and recovery. And while they may be small, micro exposures or micro experiments in facing fear without fighting can be a huge part of your overall recovery plan, especially if you're in the early stages and trying to find ways to sort of get okay with the idea that you have to stop fighting and move through anxiety and fear. If you're new to The Anxious Truth, I'm Drew Lynn Salata, creator of this podcast and I guess this YouTube channel. I'm a therapist practicing under supervision pre-licensed in the state of New York, specializing in the treatment of anxiety and anxiety disorders. I've been doing this podcast since 2014, and I'm also a three-time author on the topic of anxiety and anxiety recovery, a social media dude, a mental health advocate, I guess a psychoeducator, and unfortunately a former sufferer of anxiety disorders, depression, and OCD for quite a long time in my life. The Anxious Truth is the podcast where we talk about evidence-based concepts and practices that can help you understand and overcome issues like panic disorder, agoraphobia, health anxiety, or OCD. I do hope that you find the work I do helpful in some way, but always remember that I am one person talking to many people at the same time, which means that the content I'm producing is not therapy or a substitute for therapy. Always consult qualified in-person help if you are struggling and need more than you can get on the internet. And for more anxiety and recovery resources beyond just this podcast episode or YouTube video, feel free to visit my website at theanxioustruth.com. There are all kinds of goodies there. So check it out. So micro exposures. Lately, I've been using the term experiment more than exposure because I think it's a bit more accurate and it more clearly describes not only how to face what we fear, but why we choose to do that to get better. If you ask an agoraphobic person, for example, what exposure means to them, they will likely tell you that to learn to get back out of the house, they have to start going out of the house, even though that's really scary to them or might trigger a panic attack, for instance. They will point at things like driving or maybe walking far from home, going shopping or attending social events as examples of exposure that they might do as part of recovery. Now, this would, in fact, be an accurate description of exposure, but it doesn't always have to be that big. It certainly doesn't have to start that big. We can start this process with small micro exposures that are designed to help you recognize what allowing the experience of anxiety looks and feels like. When we incorporate micro exposures into recovery, we're learning to sort of stand up before we learn to run, which is never a bad idea. And this is especially helpful for anyone that is finding it sort of very difficult to start with bigger exposures, even on the small side. And while we might be using the word micro in this episode, don't be fooled. Micro exposures can be a really important part of the process for you to get you moving and even throughout your entire recovery journey. And I always hate when I say the word journey, but here I am using it anyway. And here's an added bonus. Micro exposures can often form the basis of really excellent mental health and stress management habits that you can take with you long after you have overcome your chronic or disordered anxiety. These little experiments, if you will, can teach us habits that we can rely on sort of for the rest of their lives. They can be really useful well beyond this process. Of course, I do have to remind you that even before I would introduce micro exposures to a therapy client, for instance, we would do some prep work. Actually, we would probably do a lot of prep work. We're always starting with an assessment of the client's unique circumstances and how they see their anxiety issues and themselves. What you believe about anxiety, how to best address it, and even what you believe about yourself and your past experiences really does matter here. So we always start with a solid base of psychoeducation, which is teaching the mechanics of anxiety disorders and recovery, and an exploration of who and where you are, so we can decide together where you can best start with exposures, even micro exposures. Now, for more psychoeducation on the mechanics of anxiety disorders and recovery, especially if you're new to the podcast or the channel, you might refer to the first 15 episodes of this podcast, even though they are, in fact, over 10 years old now. They do need updating. They're still pretty good. Or you might check out the book that I wrote, which is also called The Anxious Truth. You can find that on my website, theanxioustruth.com, or on Amazon, or anywhere else you get books. Just search for The Anxious Truth. You might find it helpful. Now, if we do exposure to learn how to fully experience anxiety, fear, or uncertainty, discomfort, or even panic, without fighting those things, it can be really helpful for us to ask ourselves how we brace against those experiences all day long. 
not just when driving or shopping or being social, or maybe going to work or school. I mean, how are we fighting, resisting and trying to control our anxiety from the moment we wake up to the time we fall asleep? When you question them, most people struggling with anxiety in a chronic or disordered state can quickly identify a long list of little micro avoidances and safety behaviors that they use all day long, trying to minimize the chances of feeling things that they are just simply afraid to feel. So I would urge you to take a minute or two, pause the podcast episode or the video if you need to. Think about what strategies you use all day long to try to lower the odds that you might feel anxious or get triggered. What are you doing to try to control, prevent, or fight against these internal experiences that you hate and fear so damn much? Are there rigid rules and rituals that you insist you must live by in order to be okay? If you do this and you find that your list is really long and that surprises you or even shocks you or upsets you, that's okay. If you have a whole bunch of little rules and rituals and avoidances and routines that you follow all day long, that's fine. It's not just you. I would say that most of the people listening to this episode or watching this video on YouTube will also have a long list of avoidances and safety behaviors that they engage in all day long. So don't beat yourself up. Now, when you're ready, resume watching and listening, and we'll explain things in a bit more detail. If you look at your list of micro avoidances or safety rituals, you will likely find things you do to control how you feel and things you refuse to do because of how you might feel if you do them. That second one is obvious for anyone that avoids big chunks of life because it triggers anxiety or even panic. But it's not just refusing to drive or socialize that we care about here. We also care about the idea that you cannot sit still or be idle or quiet for even a minute or two because then your thoughts or anxieties will catch you and make you feel a certain way. So kind of want to focus our discussion of micro exposure on that first part. The part where you can experiment even in your safe spaces with little bursts where you stop, get quiet, and allow things to happen inside you. That means sensations in your body, thoughts in your mind, or emotions. These are micro in nature because it's perfectly fine to start with 30 seconds at a time, say right in your living room or your bedroom or your kitchen. It doesn't matter. You don't have to meditate for two hours or drive 10 miles from home to do this. And the micro-ness, I think I just made that word up, of these little experience experiments means that you can repeat them often, sprinkling them throughout your day. Does the thought of stopping and being still for 60 seconds make you uncomfortable? Well, it does. You're not alone in that. When I was at my worst, that was a huge challenge for me. Feeling sensations and hearing scary thoughts was something I tried really hard to not do all day long. And most anxious people wind up in states of chronic or disordered anxiety for this very reason. The anxious feelings and thoughts themselves become threats to be avoided, resisted, or managed all day long from the time you wake up to the time you fall asleep. But consider this. If we cannot allow ourselves to feel what we feel for 60 seconds in the comfort and quiet of our home or safe places, how do you expect that you will be able to do that when you decide to go to a family function? or go to the dentist, or drive to work, or school. I'm actually learning as I work with more and more therapy clients now that the very first light bulb, air quote, moments in active recovery come when we work through little 60 second or three to five minute stillness or mindfulness exercises in session. These are the little experiments that provide the initial glimpses of how accepting sort of looks and feels. Now, if you've ever wanted to, say, watch a movie that might trigger your OCD theme or go out to dinner with your friends or drive yourself to a yoga class, which you cannot even imagine how to accept anxiety to do that, and you just want to keep asking, but how do I accept? Starting with a little 60-second experiment on your sofa is a really good way to approach this and begin to see with how it looks. So before we get into that, a quick word about meditation and mindfulness, though. Well, really two words. Resistance and expectations. Yes, two words. Many people in the community that surround this podcast and YouTube channel look sideways when I suggest things like 60 second mindfulness or meditation experiments because they feel that they just can't do it because it makes them anxious. And my answer to that is correct. This episode is about micro exposures. Exposures are things we do to intentionally feel uncomfortable because there are lessons there. 
I don't suggest mindfulness or meditation so that you can learn to not be anxious or afraid. I suggest them because there are really ways to learn how to get better at being anxious or afraid. And they can be done in small bursts anywhere, anytime. So they're super convenient and they can be really useful in that respect. And additionally, when I talk about mindfulness or meditation, no matter how often I say that these are not calming exercises or anxiety shields, it's expected and common for anxious people to try to do them to calm down anyway. Then I hear that these things sort of don't work because expectations were a bit skewed going into the exercise to begin with. So as you listen to the rest of this episode or video, sort of please keep those things in mind. I mean, you can choose to hit the stop button right now and bail on this episode. And I would absolutely respect that choice. But if what you are hearing has you thinking about how you might use micro exposures in your recovery work, please keep the ideas of resistance and expectation in mind as you go forward. You cannot use these concepts to advance in recovery while also insisting that you have to steer clear of difficult inner experiences. Those two goals are actually in direct opposition to each other, and you would have a hard time reconciling those two things. So please keep that in mind. Now, remember when I said that micro exposures can form the foundation of lifelong wellness habits? Well, you may find that if you continue to practice things like sitting quietly to accept your reality without resistance for a few minutes at a time, you will ultimately begin to find the activity maybe to be calming or relaxing in some way. That would be great, right? But if you are terrified of your own heart or your own thoughts, accessing calmness or peace or serenity through mindfulness or meditation practice is not your immediate goal. Because at first, mindfulness and meditation practices will in fact be little micro exposures for you. Now, I'm sort of thinking that maybe in two weeks in episode 301 of The Anxious Truth, we should probably do like a five minute mindfulness meditation practice together so that you can really see what that is supposed to look like. And if you'd like to do that in the next episode of the podcast, if you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment. Or if you're listening to this as a podcast episode, use your podcast app to click the link at the top of the podcast description, and that will allow you to send in a comment via text. And by the way, I'm not going to see your number. We don't use it to spam you. It's just a way for you to leave a comment on a podcast episode. So if you want to do that, let me know. And, and we will do that in the next episode. Now, if sitting quietly and mindfully to allow your internal experiences without resistance is one form of micro exposure, well, are there others? Well, there sure are. There is likely an unlimited number of micro exposures that you could do to help yourself learn recovery lessons. But in general, most of the other micro exposures are going to fall under one big umbrella, and that would be sort of removing safety rituals or routines. Not all of them, but the majority of them are going to fall under that umbrella, which is removing avoidance. So for instance, if you insist that you must use your magnesium powder every morning to stay calm that day, and I get it because I was that guy, uh, micro exposure might be skipping that tomorrow morning. If you're terrified that going to bed and getting even a minute less than eight hours of perfect slip, sleep means that you're going to get crushed by anxiety tomorrow, then a micro exposure might be pushing bedtime back for 30 minutes so that you only get seven and a half hours of sleep and seeing what happens. If you miss, say, morning coffee or tea, but avoid it because caffeine and anxiety, we all hear about that, about trying a small shot of coffee when you wake up, that would be a micro exposure. Here's an odd one. If you have any of my books on your bookshelf, but you stopped reading when you got to the parts where you start to face what you fear, reading maybe just a few more pages into the scary parts of the book might be a micro exposure that you can try. And if you can't talk to your friends right now, I mean, talk with your voice, because being trapped in a conversation might make you panic, maybe you could text a close friend or someone who will be patient with you to see if they can actually have a voice live chat for just five minutes as a micro exposure. Hey, can we talk for five minutes? I only got five minutes, but I'd like to hear your voice. That's a micro exposure. See how this works? Micro exposures can be done by removing micro avoidances and those tiny little safety and resistant devices or rituals to see what happens when you do that, but at a small scale. Because remember, we're using the word micro. I'm not suggesting that you wake up tomorrow morning and guzzle a pint of espresso as an exposure. There's a reason why I suggested maybe one or two ounce shot of coffee as a start, for example. Or maybe delay your anxiety supplements like your magnesium or whatever you think you need to take to be calm 
for an hour tomorrow before you take them. You don't want to skip them all together or push bedtime even 15 minutes later instead of 30 minutes. These count. You can actually learn lessons from them if you understand and accept that when you do these micro exposures, you will likely feel a certain way to some degree. And remember, you're choosing to do that as practice. But regardless of what form of micro exposure you want to explore, always remember that the key in any exposure of any magnitude, macro or micro, is the response prevention. ERP, exposure and response prevention, is not just for OCD. All exposure is ERP. I need to repeat that. All exposure is ERP, exposure and response prevention. If you choose to play with micro exposures, like maybe I'm describing in this episode, the point of the exposure is to refrain from saving yourself from the feelings you intentionally choose to trigger. So for instance, if you choose to sit on the sofa quietly for three minutes, go be uncomfortable for three minutes, and then you're done. You did it. If holding off on your magnesium powder for 30 minutes makes you nervous, then go be nervous for 30 minutes, and then you're done. You did it. This is really the most important part, because when the experience ends naturally as scheduled or planned, even though you didn't bail out or fix your feelings, you can learn from that. That is where the lesson is. So remember, whether it's macro or micro exposure, it's the response prevention part that we care about more than anything else. Now, tolerating uncomfortable feelings is a really big ask for everyone. This is what makes micro exposure so useful to start shorter duration with lower perceived you know, risk, if you will. But even so, if you find this at all challenging, be kind to yourself. It is supposed to be challenging to at least some degree. So if you've been struggling to come to grips with the concept of facing your fear as part of recovery, well, maybe micro exposures will offer you a way to sort of dip your toe in the water to see what it feels like. I cannot stress enough that alongside good psychoeducation and the cognitive part of cognitive behavioral therapy, even little experiments or exposures can have a significant impact on the way you view anxiety, recovery, and your belief in your ability to engage in the recovery process. So give it a shot if you're so inclined. Try some micro exposures. Take away some of your micro avoidances and safety behaviors. Sit quietly for 60 seconds and see what happens when you let things come up. Who knows what you might learn if you do that. And even though those are small things to do, they can count. So that is episode 300 of The Anxious Truth in the books. Wrapping up, you know it's over because music. Anyway, I will end the episode as I always do, and I will ask you a favor. If you are watching this as a YouTube video and you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button and maybe even hit the notification button so that you know when I upload new podcast episodes or new video content. If you're listening to the podcast as a podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or some platform that lets you rate or review the podcast, if you really like it, maybe leave a five-star review. And if you really, really like it, maybe take a minute or two and leave a review, paragraph or two, say what you like about the podcast because it helps other people find the podcast and then more people get help. That's why I do this to begin with. So another quick reminder before we wrap up, and that is today we're talking about micro exposures, small things. And that matters because at the end of every one of these episodes, especially when I started 10 years ago and lately in the last month or so, I've been back to this. I'm just going to remind you that even the small things in recovery matter. Sometimes it's just about making tiny little shifts so that you can open yourself up to a different point of view, test it, see what happens, dip your toe in the water. If you take a tiny little step today by trying a micro exposure, no matter how small that is and how insignificant you think it is because you're still anxious the rest of the day, it's okay. They all add up. Every little step helps get you closer to where you want to be, which is a life based on what you care about and not a life based on trying to avoid your own bodily sensations, thoughts, and emotions. So you can do it. Be nice to yourself. Be patient. Be kind. Experiment. See what happens. Open yourself up. You got to be brave, but I know you can do it. Thanks for listening. I will see you in two weeks in episode 301. Thanks a bunch. Oh,